I think it, it is part of getting onto the path or being ready for the path is that idea that you you just cannot think your way through things. Not this anyway. It's just there's just not it's just another thought you're having. <laughs> yeah, I mean one of the one of the, the issues I mean but, but that's so profound that the, the the recognition that oh it's just another thought. That a lot of meditators have a lot of problem with speculation. Mm. Because they try to think they because they're doubtful. Because every, because the, the whole message of the Buddha and the, the whole narrative that surrounds the ultimate teaching creates such a doubt in them that they think by thinking about it mm. first they will reach a position where they'll, then they'll understand and then they'll be able to practice. Mm. And it just doesn't work. And, and people just get themselves caught up in their thinking like a kitten with a ball of wool. Mm. The more they think, the more mm. caught up they get. Mm. Mm. And it's that willingness and that ability to say, oh no, that's just another thought, mm. is actually huge. That's quite hard. Yeah. It, is, it is. And also, speculation is just so enjoyable. Isn't it? For a lot of people. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Definitely been through that. <laughs> um, it's almost like you've got to go through it in order to reach the end of that and see. I, I totally believe that. That um, that was certainly one of my things was um, planning and speculation, and um, and even when I'd got to the point where I thought I know that doesn't work. I can't, you know, I know that now from my own <laughs> personal experience. But I'm still going to be doing it, <laughs> yeah. and it is to just get to that point where it's almost painful to sort of think, oh. Don't go over that loop again. The thing is, though, you have to accept the tendency. Yes. We call it Sankara, yes. we call it a habit, an habitual tendency. Mm. And that's important. It's important to recognise the inevitability of that habit mm. pattern coming up. Mm. And, and in a sense, not going, oh, don't, oh, don't be here, don't get... Because mm. that's, that's, that's resisting. Just, exactly. Yeah. So you have to accept the tendency. Mm. And this is where... You have to have great mindfulness, great clear comprehension of what's actually going on. To operate on that lovely balance, it's a bit like being a, on a, like a gymnast on the, you know, just this very light balance of, on the one hand, ex fully accepting the tendency towards like worry or planning. Mm -hmm. And when it does arise, having the wherewithal to say, oh, it's worry or planning, mm. it's not me, mm. it's not mine, it's a conditioned habitual tendency, mm. I've done it in the past, it's arising now, and then looking at it, mm. labelling it clearly, mm. and seeing that if I look at it, but I don't act upon it, mm. it passes away. Yes. And we call that wisdom. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think also what I think planning's all about is self-concern. And once I'd sort of realised, ah, oh, that's what it's all about, that's what it's all for, all this planning, even though it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think that realisation that it was self-concern, that I was trying to protect myself, I think. E exactly. But the thing is, if you don't do that particular habitual tendency, the, that's, that self-concern, that self-reliance, that self-awareness is redundant. Mm. So how do I know myself? Mm. And mm. suddenly you've got this emptiness, whereas before there was this sense of self and always trying to uphold this sense of self yes. through using these yes. habitual tendencies. Yes. You know you've got this situation where this fear can arise mm. because I'm not here. If I'm not doing that <laughs> habitual tendency, who am I? Where am I? Yes. What am I? Yes. Which is re actually really healthy mm. and has to be mm. looked at, but it's hard to let go of these things. Which is why people struggle to let yes. go of them. They would rather fill the void, that apparent void, because it's mm. only an apparent void, mm. with the noise of self-concern, yes. rather than enjoy the quietness of mm. a total lack of self-concern. Yes, because uh, although that fear does arise, there is also a sense of relief that you've got to that stage. Oh, it's self-concern, so. You can then look at that. I always and say that sort of separating that uh, people do all the time, because again, it's all about coping strategies and getting through life, isn't it? It is, and so you, on the one hand, you have to have that self compassion to say to say exactly that. Oh yeah, of course, these have been coping strategies I've mm. used, but now 
I'm looking at this in a different way. I'm a different mm, human being. Mm, mm. I've got this this platform, this this strategy, this new strategy that I can employ, which means that they are now redundant. Mm. And have that compassion to say, yeah, of course these things are going to come up, but I don't have to act upon them now. I don't have to believe the content of yes. the thought now. And there is a lovely quietitude when you are not self-obsessed. When you're, it, it's... it's it's Freedom from neurotic preoccupation. <laughs> it is. It's just a massive relief. Um, even though you don't know what's coming next, it's still a massive relief. And that's another reason why people go back into thinking. Because <laughs> mm, it's safe. It's safe. They apparently, think. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah only apparently. Yeah. And it is only an apparent return to this a sense of separation. Mm. Ultimately, there is no sense. There is no separation. No. And this is all part of... Letting go of delusions mm. and looking at life. You, but you have to do all this first before you can really then explore the truth of the underlying reality, that apparent emptiness. A lot of meditators, they'll come, to, they'll reach that point and they'll come to me and go, well, there's nothing going on. And I go, what? <laughs> yeah, like of course there's something going on. <laughs> and you, you, you return them to looking at their experience, but perhaps now with a list of, ultimate phenomena to to apply so you know what's materiality in this experience what's consciousness what's mm. feeling what's perception what are mental formations mm. and you start mm. to you suddenly open up to the fact there's this whole world of intimate experience mm. going on mm. which you can actually label note and observe that indeed none of it lasts mm. so and then you're really undoing those wrong perceptions mm-hmm. and those wrong views by looking closely at life. And that's yeah. very exciting. I that is that. fascinating. Just, yes, yeah, fascinating. Yes, yeah. that's the word, yes. And there's a calmness about that that you don't have with your coping strategies. <laughs> but that's the path of least resistance to go back to what you were always doing, Com- isn't comfort. it? The comfort zone, comfort, yeah. yes. And, and everyone... So, for everyone who meditates, there is, I think, an initial period where you... And this is why I think keeping a journal and wise reflection really comes in help, helpful. To acknowledge the likelihood of certain things arising first mm. in the meditation. Mm. And it, to the fact that it takes time for the mind to settle. And you allow for that. Yeah. And that if you do, then the, you know, the whole thing settles beautifully and you, you can start observing things arise and pass away. So all that's a part of... The, of the, of the process but then you yeah you you deal with that tendency to want to go back to the habitual you deal with that tendency to want the line of least resistance and choose the harder path and the more you do it the more accustomed because it is it's just accustoming the mind to a new routine mm, it's a sort of shift isn't it i mean i liken it to it's it's like creating a new neural pathway right I mean, for, in Buddhism, mind always comes first. So it, it is volition creating a neural pathway, not a neural pathway creating volition. volition yes. <laughs> Controversy. <laughs> We're not scientists, you know. This isn't no. science. This is a spiritual um, mm. undertaking. Uh, so, so yeah, but it, it it is having to accept the fact that it takes time to learn the new routine. Mm. But once you do... Uh, uh, each time you go to sit, it becomes a delight. Mm. Because if, you, if you've got your mindfulness, seven factors of enlightenment, if you've got your mindfulness and you're investigating rightly, which is to say you're not looking, you're not looking into the future, you're not looking into the past, you're not trying to make the meditation into anything, you're not trying to make it peaceful, you're not trying to make it content, you're, not, you're just literally allowing whatever wants to arise to arise and noting it, labelling it and observing the fact that it's transient then that's right energy. So you've got a lovely balanced energy. The next thing to come up is pleasurable interest. So there is this wonderful absorption and interest in what you're doing. So you get Mm -hmm. tranquil, you get concentrated, and this lovely Mm even-mindedness emerges, Mm -hmm. equanimity. And for we, at the House of Inner Tranquility, we practice dry insight, which means we don't do deep states of concentration first, unless somebody is just naturally or they've already worked out how to do that, mm. we tend to go for dry insights. So with you, I know that there was metta in order to help calm 
and concentrate the mind. Mm-hmm. There was a recollection that you did yes. to get the mind suitably pliant and devotional and yes. faithful and yes, so forth. Yes, a little agenda. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little routine. <laughs> Just to sort of get it going. Yes. Yeah, but it brought it brought a sense of settledness. It brought a sense of calm mm. before then going yeah. doing inside meditation. And I, and I didn't do them thinking, right, I'll get the recollection out of the way and I'll get the meta out of the way and then I can... I, I, <laughs> I had a lot of interest in the recollection It was and the meta. It was important for me to be doing those things. And then somehow I didn't think about, oh, and then I'll get... It just became the Vipassana after I'd done those things, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's important to... It, to, to acknowledge that vipass- proper vipassana meditation is observation of the three marks, transience, unsatisfactoriness and non-self. So all the things like loving kindness or doing recollections in order to calm and quieten the mind and get it free of hindrances, get it free of that mm-hmm. selfish preoccupation, that's all really samatha. Right. That's the samatha side of it. But you need, So you need a certain amount of both. Mm-hmm. But you don't need jhana level concentration you don't need absolute absorption mm. you just need to be free of hindrances which re- it re- is really a suitable place to be doing with personal meditation yes. um, and so yes that's important to, to recognize that but yeah meditation you can take your time I mean if you're meditating for an hour that's a whole hour mm. even if you know you spend 15 20 minutes half an hour mm. allowing the mind to calm down because mm. people are Meditating after a hard day at work, yes. you know, inevitably the minds can be full of worries and concerns about the day. And you know, if I often say, if somebody's meditating for half an hour and for twenty-five minutes, it's a total jumble. But for you know, a few moments, they they observe transience, mm-hmm. then it's been a roaring success. Yes. <laughs> it's working. It's working. Yeah. And the more you see, the lovely thing is, you get, you create this lovely virtuous circle. Whereas the, the more you see transience, the more you see unsatisfactoriness, the more you see non-self, the less you practice neurotic preoccupations like hindrances, mm. like mm. ill will and sexual desire. What is the point? Because this, the thing that you're you're so you're desiring that sensuous experience, you're also noticing is entirely transient, mm. and the two just can't go together. The more you see transience, the less preoccupied you become with trying to obtain. Yes, pleasure because yeah. there's nothing in it then because once you see the transience there's, there's nothing in it for you to go there so mm-hmm. as a result the more calm you are mm-hmm. generally and so you go into the meditation karma because your, your your life outside of the meditation has not been spent in the obsessive pursuit of pleasure mm-hmm. you know so so it, it creates this lovely virtuous loop and you really get stuck into the path and mm. and um, life takes on a completely different it does it does view. you know you see life just in a completely different way mm.